The digestion and nutrition section is quite large. There's a lot of information. However, this module is going to focus on the anatomy of the digestive tract, including the histology. You should reinforce this information in a lab with either the cadaver, dissected pigs, or models. There's also a PowerPoint with images from a cadaver with the parts that you need to be able to identify in the lab test. The objectives of this model are again to identify the organs and the basic function of each. Module 2 will focus more on the physiology of the digestive system, but functions will be listed and discussed at least a little bit here. Make yourself some flashcards or use your study sheet. Can you identify 1 through 6 here? These are the very basic organs. The esophagus, the liver, the colon, the stomach, the small intestines, and rectum for number 1 through 6 respectively. This diagram is a bit more detailed but shows all of the major organs of the digestive system. The next slides will discuss each of these in more detail, but here's the basic list and function of each. The mouth chews the food and the tongue mixes it with saliva. The pharynx and the esophagus move food to the stomach. The stomach mixes and breaks down food, secretes enzymes and acid. The liver produces bile and the gallbladder stores it. The pancreas makes enzymes and bicarbonate. These secretions along with bile are released into the duodenum as the stomach empties. More digestion, mostly chemical via enzymes, takes place in the small intestine. Food moves through there and all the glucose, amino acids, and fatty acids should be absorbed before the material reaches the colon. Food is put into the large intestine at the cecum and then travels up the ascending, across the transverse, and down the descending colon, into the sigmoid colon, and finally stored in the rectum until defecation. Digestion is defined as the mechanical and chemical breakdown of food into molecules that can be absorbed. In other words, the macromolecules are broken down to the building blocks. This occurs in the alimentary canal, which is an open tube from mouth to butt, essentially. The organs of the digestive system in which food does not pass through are called accessory organs. These include the pancreas, gallbladder, and liver, and sometimes salivary glands are also included on this list. Digestion from inside out the mo uh, innermost layer of the alimentary canal is the mucosa layer. Since it has space on one side, the lumen, which may contain food if you just ate, is the mucosa layer and, the epith and is epithelial in nature. This epithelium has all the glands and the cells that absorb the building blocks. Its functions include protection, secretion, and absorption. Underneath this is the submucosa layer, which is connective tissue that functions to support the mucosa layer. It contains connective tissue, glands, blood vessels, lymph vessels, and nerves. Its function, nourish the mucosa layer. Next is the muscular wall, all of smooth muscle, which helps mix and move the food material. Smooth muscle is involuntary and is activated by the parasympathetic nervous system to contract. The outermost layer is the serosa. It secretes fluid, watery fluid, called serous fluid, to reduce friction when these organs move around. It's also called the visceral peritoneum. Its function, reduce friction. A nice diagram of the four layers is shown here. Make a note of the mucosa, submucosa, smooth muscle, and serosa layers in this picture. The first part of the alimentary canal is your mouth. It is used to mechanically and chemically digest food, teeth mechanically, and amylase and saliva to break down carbs. The parts of the mouth include the lips, which sense food, and cheeks, which keep food in the mouth during chewing. The tongue mixes food with saliva, which makes it moist, and also uh, buffers f the acid in the food. The tongue also contains taste buds. The palate, the roof of the mouth, has two parts, the hard palate, made of the palatine bone, and the soft palate, or uvula, which is in the back of the mouth. Both function to keep food from going up your nose. The tonsils, the palatine ones, fight infection by catching microbes on food. The pharyngeal tonsils, or adenoids above and behind the uvula, are more likely to catch microbes that you breathe in. The back of the tongue also has lingual tonsils, again lymph tissue to help catch pathogens. The teeth mechanically break down food. We have teeth that tear, incisors, and teeth that grind, the molars. Here's another good picture of teeth. Teeth are covered with enamel, the hardest substance in the body, to protect them against bacteria. Fluorine is needed for enamel synthesis. 
Salivary glands secrete mucus and amylase. Amylase is an enzyme that helps break down carbs. Saliva is slightly basic, so it neutralizes uh, acidic food that we consume, which can hurt or harm the enamel. Saliva also moistens food, and this helps uh, keep it mixed better. Seeing, smelling, or even thinking about food can increase saliva secretion from the three major glands. The parotid, the largest, which is in front of each ear, the submandibular, the floor of the mouth, and the sublingual, which is under the tongue. The only part of the cheeseburger chemically digested in the mouth is the bun. There are no enzymes in saliva that break down fats or proteins. The pharynx, which is a fancy word for throat, is part of both the respiratory and the digestive system. The nasal part behind the nose usually contains only air. The oral pharynx contain food and air, and the laryngopharynx, which again should just be air going down to the voice box. Swallowing is a reflex, but it can be involuntary and involuntarily um, initiated. But it can be voluntarily initiated. But if you put food back there, swallowing should occur. Watch this emanation closely. The uvula raises and the epiglottis covers the voice box as the pharynx raises and the esophagus opens and food goes down. Okay, so you have to watch it a couple of times to kind of see that. The esophagus, which is about 10 uh, inches long, goes from the pharynx to the stomach, and its function is to carry food. It only secretes mucus, so not much digestion is going on, if any beyond what the salivary amylase might still be doing. The mucus moistens the food and lubricates the tube so it's, it doesn't get too worn off as food passes by. The esophagus ends at the stomach when the food goes through the cardiac sphincter. The part of the respiratory system involved in swallowing is the epiglottis, and the overlap is the oral pharynx. In case you are into the development of the digestive system, the alimentary canal is a simple canal from mouth to butt. It just gets more complex as the animals get more complex. Moving from the esophagus to the stomach, you can see here the esophagus meets the stomach in this image. This is what a normal esophagus, or healthy esophagus, looks like. This is not a normal esophagus. The esophagus is ulcerated here probably because the person um, either has a genetic risk for this or smoking or alcoholism can also cause this to happen. The stomach is a J-shaped organ that holds about one liter. It's very muscular and it's folded inside to increase the surface area, which I'll show you a picture of shortly. Food moves into the esophagus through the esophageal or cardiac sphincter into the cardiac region. If large amounts of food are eaten, some of the food will be pushed up into the fundic region, kind of a storage area, whereas most of the food ends up in the body, where the major digestion takes place. It can also hold air. The food moves into the um, pyloric region just before it is excreted or pushed out into the first part of the duodenum. Food mixes, the stomach mixes the food with all the secretions of the stomach, and that mix is now called chyme, C-H-Y-M-E. Chyme should not move back up the esophageal sphincter into the esophagus. That causes acid reflux, and it burns because the esophagus is not meant to handle acid conditions. It should also not move too quickly through the pyloric sphincter into the duodenum, as it can overwhelm the duodenum. It's actually regulated how fast move, food moves out of the stomach and into the duodenum. The inner lining of the stomach is folded into mucosal ridges called rugae. And you can see those here. This allows for expansion of the stomach. Gastric glands produce gastric juice, which is a mix of several different things. First, mucus. Mucus is secreted by the mucus cells. The chief cells secrete pepsin and gastric lipase and renin. The main secretion is pepsin. Pepsin digests proteins into peptides and amino acids. Lipase and renin help digest fat, but this is of low quantities in most people except in babies. 
parietal cells secrete the acid. HCL, or hydrochloric acid, breaks down food and denatures proteins because of its high acidic content. Essentially, pH of the stomach is down around 1, 1 or 2. Parietal cells also secrete intrinsic factor, which is required for vitamin B12 absorption. It binds vitamin B12 in the stomach and allows it to be absorbed later uh, in the colon. Check out this uh, quick video to help you understand how Nexium works to block acid production. The intestinal tract is specialized for the absorption of nutrients, and many structures are present to increase the surface area to allow for this. First, you have plique circulaires, which are permanent transverse folds in the small intestine, which, if you stretched it out, would have more surface area than just a smooth inner lining of the tube, if you think of a hose. Next, you have villi, which project into the intestine. Again, increases the surface area. Since the main job of the small intestine is to absorb things, having plique circulaires and villi will increase this. 90% of nutrient absorption occurs in the small intestine, and only the last 10% in the large. So you have six feet of small intestine that will help you absorb all your nutrients. In fact, you really don't want the building blocks to get to the large intestine because the bacteria there will have a little party with them, causing gas, pain, and bloating for you. This is a normal appearance of the ileum. You can see in the upper frame some of these darker patches are the lymph nodes, or the Peyer's patches, which help uh, get rid of the microbes on our food. This is a picture of a villi. Intestinal villi are projections of the mucosa layer into the small intestine to increase the surface area to advance absorption. Along the edge of this are uh, little tiny cells called microvilli cells. These are the simple columnar epithelial cells, and at the outer edge of them are microvilli, which are tiny uh, projections of the cell, and these two are function, function to increase the surface area. The lumen is the space and should contain the food, okay? and each villi in each inside contains blood vessels as well as a lymph vessel called a lacteal. So the food particles are out here, and as the building blocks are absorbed, they go into the microvilli cells and pass across the other side, the basement membrane, into the blood vessel or the lacteal. Along the way, there are also glands, and you can see some here, goblet cells, secreting mucus, but also the glands are going to be secreting uh, digestive enzymes. So again, you have villi, and each villi is made up of thousands of simple columnar epithelial cells, and each epithelial cell has microvilli at the end. Here's another normal picture of the intestine, the simple columnar epithelial cells with lots of embedded goblet cells secreting mucus. So the small intestine is up to 20 feet long in a cadaver, but without muscle tone, you can stretch it all the way out. You probably can't stretch it out 20 feet in a, in a live person. It has three sections, the duodenum, the jejunum, and the ileum. And the duodenum is the first part, about 10 uh, inches long or so. And then the middle part is the jejunum, and finally the ileum. It's held together by a system of membranes and blood vessels called the mesentery. And over top of the entire intestinal system is a layer of fat in a membrane called the greater omentum. You can see that in this next picture here. The mesentery holding the intestines and the greater omentum has kind of been flipped up. Here in this picture, it's covering uh, the major intestinal organs. You can see the greater omentum number 11 there. Uh, that fat is not the kind of fat you want to lose. That's the only thing kind of keeping our organs in place. Seen here is a loop of the bowel attached. You can see the membrane holding the blood vessels, the arteries and veins up to the uh, intestinal system. The small intestine secretes a variety of things. Number one is mucus. It keeps everything slippery and slimy and moving things along. Uh, there's also lots of water because as things get more moist, the enzymes work better. 
The small intestine also secretes many enzymes, one of which is peptidases to break down proteins to amino acids, sucrases, maltases, and lactases to break down disaccharides, and intestinal lipase. Lipase breaks down fats to fatty acids. If you're missing lactase, for example, you are referred to as lactose intolerance because you can't break down lactose and then the lactose gets to the large intestine and again the bugs there have a little party causing uh, diarrhea, and pain, and bloating for you. So sometimes people who are lactose intolerant may take that enzyme, lactate, it might be marketed as, to help break down the lactose in their milk products so they don't get that side effect. The main job of the small intestine is to absorb nutrients. Loss of milk microvilli would inhibit this because of the giant decrease in surface area. And the microbes then would have a little party with all those nutrients once they got to the large intestine, cause gas pain and bloating. The next couple of slides are going to go over some of the accessory organs. Remember an accessory organ is a organ involved in digestion but food doesn't pass directly through it. The liver is the largest internal organ. It is on the right side, right under your diaphragm, and has four lobes. It contains both hepatocytes and cupfer cells, as well as connective tissue cells. The hepatocytes are the ones that do the metabolizing work of the liver. The cupfer cells are macrophages to remove uh, toxins, and connective tissue holds it all together. Remember, it is reticular connective tissue that forms the scaffolding to hold the hepatocytes and cuffer cells all in the same place. Sometimes fat builds up in the liver, especially if the person is alcoholic and you get an overgrowth of connective tissue, and that's referred to as cirrhosis of the liver. The hepatic portal vein carries nutrients directly from the small intestines to the liver, so the liver kind of gets to see all the nutrients from the food that you eat first. It mixes with arterial blood on the way out, and much of the blood sugar is actually removed by the liver before it gets to the rest of the body. The liver has uh, many, many, many functions, and it uses many of the nutrients that we eat. It can store them, like glycogen. It can store vitamins. It can burn them. It can do glycolysis, electron, uh, the Krebs cycle, electron transport. It burns fats. It burns carbs. It can use proteins. It can make various molecules out of the proteins. It can store iron. It filters the blood. Remember the heme, bilirubin, biliverdin thing? It also detoxifies uh, drugs and alcohol from the body. It gets rid of pathogens. Um, too much detoxification of alcohol, if you drink a lot of alcohol, can induce synthesis of fats in the liver, leading to cirrhosis of the liver. But the main job the liver has when it comes to digestion is making bile. Bile is required for the digestion of fat. Bile is made up of four things bile salts, bile pigments, cholesterol, and electrolytes. Only bile salts really have the active function. It is an emulsifier. In other words, it breaks up fat droplets into smaller droplets, kind of like what dish soap does in a, in a sink full of grease. So bile salts, the active ingredient, emulsify or break down fat, kind of like a detergent. Bile is also required for the absorption of vitamins A, D, E, and K. And almost all of the bile salts are reabsorbed or recycled. Extra bile is stored in the gallbladder, and it goes there via the hepatic duct, but leaves via the common bile duct where it meets the pancreatic duct and dumps into the duodenum. I'll show you a picture of this in a second. If the bile gets pushed up into the gallbladder and crystallizes, it can form gallstones. And if they would stay in the gallbladder, that would be fine. Uh, but if they come out of the gallbladder and get stuck in one of those ducts, it blocks bile release, which can be really, really bad for people. Again, bile is released when you eat a large fat meal, and it dumps through the hepatopancreatic sphincter into the duodenum. The pancreas also secretes a variety of secretions into the duodenum. Together they're called pancreatic juice. It mixes with the chyme that's coming from the stomach. About one quart per day of pancreatic juice is produced. It contains amylase, which helps digest carbs. It contains pancreatic lipase, which helps digest fats, and trypsin, which helps digest protein. It also contains bicarbonate. Bicarbonate neutralizes the chyme. 
is remember the pH of the stomach is down by down to one or two and the duodenum you want it back up to six or seven. It's very important that the bicarbonate is released because the duodenum is very susceptible to acid conditions and could be burned by the acid. Blocking the pancreatic duct would severely inhibit digestion. Alcoholism and other things can cause pancreatitis and cause this to be blocked. Sometimes the enzymes, particularly trypsin, will actually back up and digest the pancreas itself, which is really bad news for you. Perhaps you can see this better in this picture. Liver makes bile, comes down the hepatic duct. It will back up the cystic duct and be stored in the gallbladder. So this is the cystic duct. This is the hepatic duct. But when it's released into the duodenum, it's coming down the common bile duct. And it meets the pancreatic duct and dumps into the duodenum right here. That's called the hepatopancreatic sphincter, or sometimes the sphincter of Odi. So you have chyme coming from the stomach, bile from the liver, and pancreatic juice from the pancreas, all mixing right here. Bile to di uh, emulsify the fat, bicarbonate to neutralize, and all those enzymes to help digestion. Okay. Here's another picture where the hepatopancreatic duct or sphincter of Odi meets the duodenum, bile, and pancreatic juice. Pancreas, liver, and gallbladder are all accessory organs. Are they required for digestion? You bet. You need bile and you need bicarbonate and pancreatic enzymes. If you go back to the previous slide, can you imagine what happens if a gallstone got stuck right here? You would block bile and pancreatic juice, which would be really bad for you. The colon has no villi and much less smooth muscle, and the only secretion really is mucus. The colon can absorb water, minerals, and vitamins, but doesn't really absorb much nutrients. The bacteria there, if you send nutrients, are going to have a party with them though. If not enough water is absorbed in time, if, or if the large intestine is too short to allow for it, you're going to have diarrhea. Whereas if food spends too much time there or too much water is absorbed, constipation is the result. The bacteria in the colon um, make some vitamins, uh, particularly vitamin K, uh, vitamin B12 is absorbed there. Um, bacteria can also produce gas from the cellulose that you may eat or fiber or the building blocks if you got some there and they weren't absorbed in the small intestine. So there can be lots of things going on in the colon depending on what you eat and how much gets there. The large intestine has uh, several regions. The part where the, f the small meets the large is called the cecum. That's the first part of the, lower, the large intestine and it is located in your lower right quadrant. Where the ilia meets the large intestine is called the cecum and there's a denim pouch called the appendix that hangs off of that. It can sometimes get infected if material gets trapped in there. Other than that, there's no known function of the appendix. After the cecum, the material moves up the ascending colon, across the transverse colon, and down the descending colon before getting to a little S-curve called the sigmoid colon. The material is then stored in the rectum until defecation. The rectum is attached to the sacrum and leads to the anal uh, canal. The anal sphincter muscle moves waste out of the body. You have both an external and an uh, anal sphincter and an internal anal sphincter. The external anal sphincter is under voluntary control, um, up to a point anyway. Pushing or pressure on the internal anal sphincter uh, basically tells the person that they have to go and then the person can get to a place where it's okay to do that and voluntarily uh, relax the external anal sphincter to allow the defecation reflex to occur. This is a normal appearance of an appendix and this is a not so normal one. Okay. Generally people have high white blood cell count and rebound tenderness in the lower right quadrant when they have appendicitis. Here's a histology slide of the lining of the colon. You can see the many many goblet cells because again mucus is the main secretion of the large intestine. So check out your online text, the online lesson, you can always Google uh, to get more information about the anatomy of the digestive system.